Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's great to see such a number of people here. Uh, so, as Shadi said, my name is Hebe Harris from Scotland. Um, I was here for six months with a fellowship uh, looking at something with a very long title. Uh, so, balancing benefits across multiple ownership working forest landscapes. The bit focusing on this is the working landscape part. So, I think of that as uh, needing to deliver benefits for the economy, for the people, and for the environment. And that's what I've been looking at, how that's done in the Pacific Northwest and how I can learn things to take back to Scotland. So a little bit about Scotland. Um, it's famous for not being England. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jan, I stole that one. Uh, um, so we're online with the Alaska Panhandle, uh, but we have the Gulf Stream, which keeps us a little bit warmer. Um, and the interesting thing in terms of forestry is that we are considerably less forested than you are in the Pacific Northwest, only 18%, and uh, our percentages of uh, public and private land uh, are switched, so we have two-thirds of private. So it makes it even more important that we talk to everybody. So, with no more ado, um, I think I need first to establish what landscape is. So to me, uh, landscape is not just a large area of land. It has to have some connectivity, some coherence. So generally, for me at least, it, it means an ecological coherence. And within those landscapes, generally we have a huge number of different ownerships that are under different pressures, different constraints, different motivations. So we need to take that into consideration when we're trying to think across a whole landscape. So if you lay on top of that, um, over here you've got state lines, which means that you have uh, different forest practices, rules on either side of the line, and also you have to think about the ecology. So you have physical links across these landscapes, so rivers that flow with water, you have species that migrate through the landscape, and then you may have tree seeds, for example, that uh, travel across these landscapes. And they have no respect for any of these boundaries we've been talking about. So we can't forget about people. People are very important. Uh, so they may live in uh, cities uh, where they expect clean air, clean water, um, they expect to be able to go recreate in forests. Um, and then we've got people dispersed across the landscapes, many of which whose jobs may depend on natural resources, including forest management. So. My very, very simplified version of uh, the feeling that I've got over the last six months of how forests are managed in the Pacific Northwest. So pre-Endangered Species Act, uh, you actually probably, you could uh, envisage that as uh, timber interests being very much uh, in the power seat. Um, and then after the Endangered Species Act, things seem to swing over to the environmental side, um, and all of this is backed up by court cases. It's a very simplified version, but to me, coming from the culture that I come from in terms of forest management, it's almost forest management by court. Um, and I have to say, is that uh, the most efficient system? It may be, it may work the best for you guys over here, or it may not. But um, certainly back home, we have a very distant system in terms of we try to find compromise wherever possible. But it was very interesting. I had uh, a meeting with a lawyer and uh, she had a very interesting thing to say. So she said that forest management was a problem to be solved, not a fight to be fought. So that was coming from a lawyer, uh, which you might want to consider that. Um, so. While I was here, I did see some great uh, examples of landscape scale thinking. So starting on the top left, this is an example uh, of their planning map for Metro, uh, where they've thought about the ecology first, um, and it's not very clear, but those little blue dots uh, are areas of forest that they're trying to link up, and they're looking at ways to be able to do that across the landscape. Top right is the Forest Service Collaboratives, um, they are very much trying to work with environmental interests to gain social license to do some level of logging on federal land. Logging is not always a bad thing. 
Uh, and then bottom left, all land collaboratives, uh, they're really interesting. So they include private land and public land and potentially state land as well. Um, and they tend to be coalesced uh, around common interests, particularly fire, which all of you probably have that much more in the front of your minds these days than maybe previously. Um, and we had the privilege to go to be able to visit tribal land um, from comments I've had from various people, different tribes very much managed in different ways, but the one that we visited uh, was certainly looking at things in a very multiple benefit landscape way, which is very interesting. So I've tried to, again, oversimplify in seven minutes, sum up six months. Uh, so this is a three-dimensional uh, graph. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that I think the ideal that in Scotland and everywhere we need to be striving for is to try and align the three benefits that we expect and hope to get from our forests. So that may include community benefits out in East Oregon. We've got the privilege to go visit a biomass uh, installation that heats the local school um, and also enables pre-commercial thinning which reduces the fire risk of the forests. Uh, there's the environment. I got to go down to near Yahat and help out with a survey of marble murrelets. The idea of that being that we, if we build up more science understanding, then we can define exactly what the murrelets need, uh, which means that we may be able to open up some of those forests to logging that won't compromise the murrelets. And uh, the final one of the three uh, axes is forest revenue, obviously. Um, in Scotland, we've got a saying, the forest that pays is the forest that stays, and I very much believe that. Um, so apart from the obvious, which is timber revenue, uh, there's, uh, we've got the privilege to talk to some people uh, about other revenues they might be trying to gain, which could be truffle farming, or it could be essential oils, um, anything like that. So that's kind of why, what I would like to take back and try and see happening more and more in Scotland. And somebody did say to me, um, it's all about trying to get civic conversation happening. I would add a few words to that. I would say it needs to be civil, civic conversation. <laughs> um, and also that it needs to lead to cooperative action. If you have conversation with no action, it's not going to benefit anybody. So finally, I would like to say thank you very much for um, being here tonight for all the people that gave me their valuable time to help me with my project, and for whoever managed to coordinate the fact that the eclipse happened while I was here. <laughs> Thanks very much.